So there's a lot of debate about where we're headed with interest rates in the short term, but also in the longer term, where we're going to settle down when all this is over, whenever that is. Uh, give us your perspective, not just on that question, but does the Fed have the right way of thinking about the question? Yeah, I mean, it, boy, it's a pretty complex question because there are so many factors at play today. In fact, we introduced in the last month, we introduced something that wasn't part of the equation, that the financial sector instability and the banking system. So that introduced another dynamic to the Fed, which quite frankly, I think has an influence. <clears throat> so listen, I, I think the Fed is, is right to focus on inflation. We've got the funds rate up and, and the market's projecting they're gonna go to five and a quarter, which seems about right in terms of where the funds rate is gonna get to. But now you gotta think about you know, you've gone from zero. Think about where we were last year. The funds rate was at 50 base. This time last year, we're at 50 base points. And we're doing 120 billion in QE. Now we're going to the other extreme. I think the thing that Fed really has to focus on now, can you move and then hold rates here for a period of time without doing too much damage to the economy? You've seen damage in the banking industry. You've seen damage in commercial real estate. You're seeing damage playing out in auto finance. And I think the Fed really needs to think about, let's be patient now. So if they're trying to figure out how much damage are we doing, how much can we tolerate, what factors should they be looking at? What, what is on their dashboard, should be on their dashboard saying, wait a second, this is damages is too much? So, I mean, I, you know, I think people underestimate, first of all, commercial real estate is about a $10 trillion market. Residential real estate is about four times the size. The other stat that I don't think people realize, the banking system is critically important, but it's only about 15%, depending on how you measure it, of the financing in the country. So you gotta think about what other things, boy, did he hurt the banking system? How much capital, when you move rates this much, you think about other areas, venture capital, et cetera. It's part of why we've never seen rates move this much higher. We've never seen this much QE put in and then let's back off. And so there are so many considerations. Modern economy is incredibly complex. Yeah, and as I understand you, you're not saying we shouldn't pay attention to inflation at all, but there are other factors as well. And I know you have a different sort of analysis comparing, on the one hand, mm -hmm. unemployment with inflation, sort of a traditional way of doing it, as opposed to comparing employment with real wages. So if you go back, yes, yeah, so the, you know, the traditional misery index, unemployment, inflation, and the Fed's job is how do we improve both of those for the general well-being of the economy? However, at a unique point in time, why is inflation higher? You had two exogenous shocks. You had a pandemic, and they had massive monetary and fiscal stimulus come and try and, and uh, to try and solve that. And then you had a war, a global war that in fact infected food prices, uh, energy prices, and by the way, will create a deglobalization that creates some durable inflation. So those were pretty extreme dynamics. So now we have to like, how does the Fed bring that inflation down? But it's pretty hard to bring those big macro structural dynamics down quickly. However, if wages for the people that are being infected by higher shelter, food, energy costs are higher, maybe we can tolerate it a bit longer. And maybe the costs of bringing that inflation down unilaterally to a 2% goal is too painful to, to, to create, to take three, two or three million people out of work. To, you know, the people that are getting hurt by this inflation, there's a trade-off today. It's as long as wages are up, as long as we're moving capital to labor, which is happening today and has been happening, that's really effective. So I just think Fed needs to exhibit a bit more patience. We don't have to hit the 2% target next month. So time is really important in what you just said. How mm. much time does the Fed have with the 2%? They've sort of put that marker down. <laughs> they can't just walk away from it. But how much time do they have to get there? Yeah, I mean, the Fed, you know, the Fed gets a lot of critics. There are a lot of critics and a lot of criticism. And can we pause for a year? Can we pause for six months? You're going to see real credit contraction. The banking system is going to amplify that credit contraction. You're going to see the natural forces. And you're seeing things like trucking. You think about how pressurized that was. I've seen some data about trucking being in a recession now. A lot of the supply chain issues are alleviating themselves. Give it a bit of time. And you know some of the things like food costs, that comes down. And so let's be specific here. When you say pause, pause now before the May de de decision. Gonna, and by the way, when do they start coming down again? So I think the debate, I think they're going to get in a room. And I think they're different constituents on that Fed committee. I think they're going to get in a room and hash out, can we pause now? My sense is, as long as the economy is OK, as long as you don't see more stress in the banking system, my sense is they want to do one more. And then I think that will be the compromise. We're going to do one more, and then we're going to, then we're going to put it on hold. Listen, I don't, the markets have priced in that the Fed's going to ease. It's come, a lot of it's come out recently, but it's priced in they're going to start easing. It was in the summer. So I think the Fed is going to start easing next year. 
it's possible in December. What are the markets telling you, Rick Reeder, about coming down? Because there was yeah. something in the last Fed minutes yeah. that suggested some of what we're seeing in the Fed funds futures yeah. right now is a matter of liquidity injection because of the financial <laughs> issues yeah. with Silicon Valley Bank and the likes. Wasn't so much about an anticipated cut. No, you hear people all the time saying the markets are, st are stupid. They think the Fed's going to ease. Of course, the Fed's not going to ease. Markets are actually not that stupid. What they're doing is they're pricing in two things. One, the liquidity is immense. People are piling huge amounts of money. I mean, we haven't seen these short-term interest rates. I mean, you could buy, I've been buying commercial paper at 6%. And so people are like, get me, I want to lock in maybe a little longer term <clears throat> if I can lock in these short-term interest rates. There's a <clears throat> massive amount of liquidity that's come in. That's one. Second being, when, Pete, when the Fed cuts rates, people don't believe it's going to be, well, we'll start easing gradually 25 base points. If the banking system has a problem, if you have more duress in the system, they're going to cut interest rates really quickly. You know, is that 100 basis points at a time? So what the markets are doing is a probability adjusted ratio of actually maybe they're not going to cut rates gradually, but maybe they cut them a lot. Well, if they start cutting rates because of some pressure on the banking system, <clears> how does it work? Does that ease some of the mark-to-market <clears> problems <throat> we saw, for example, at Silicon Valley Bank? Where yeah. They have treasuries on their books <clears throat> that are not worth as much as they used to be. Yeah, this was a unique, uh, I don't want to describe it as crisis, this is a unique period in the banking system. And so you think about what happened, the banks were getting hurt on two, but with quality assets, treasuries, agency, mortgages, to a large extent, a commercial real estate being an issue, obviously. What was incredible is you got hurt two ways because your assets on the balance sheet were getting hurt because the yields moving higher. At the same time, your funding costs were going up significantly, so you were getting hurt on both sides. Ultimately, the only way you get the banking system to a period of greater stability, again, protect deposits from not flowing out, but you've got to normalize the price of your assets on the books with your cost of funding coming down. And so that is the, that's part of why I think they're going to be cutting rates today. A lot of the assets on banks' balance sheets are yielding three and a half, and they're funding them at five and a half. That is a losing proposition. And so you've got to normalize that, get the assets up in price, and bring your funding, and bring your funding down. And, that, and so you have to get, that's the only way you're going to get there. How much of that is inherent in demand deposits? Because you're funding short term by net definition, you're making longer term investments. If you're a different kind of asset manager that can lock up money, the investments for a long period of time, do you have an advantage over the banks? What does it mean for the future of banking? How much time do we have? <laughs> this is, uh, I mean, that, that is a tricky question. And you know, one of the things I think about all the time is it gets a capital. It's what are your assets, it's uh, what are your assets, your liability, your cost, what are you getting paid on your assets, are you getting paid on your liabilities, and what's the term of each? So I think something's going to happen on the back side of this. You're going to see capital raised in the banking system, but I think regulation <clears throat> and efficient regulation will be how do you manage duration? Well, how much uh, in, uh, downward pressure on the real economy is the uncertainty imposing? Yeah, so you know, this is part of the reason why I think the Fed has to pause, because nobody has the playbook for this, and nobody really knows. Listen, I think when you stress it and you think about you know, you're going to get credit contraction. How much does it affect GDP? You know, I've seen numbers all, you know, I would say it's not a bad assessment to say it's 50 basis points on GDP. Let's say you were running real GDP that was going to be about 1% this year. You're taking about half off of it. What does it mean for investment, though, is incredibly stratified. There are cyclical parts of the economy and non-cyclical parts of the economy. There are interest-sensitive parts of the economy, non-interest-sensitive. You know, today, a lot of the equity investments we're making, things like defense, healthcare, parts of technology, not that interest rate sensitive. I'd rather stay there for a while, see how the cyclicals play out, see how what is sensitive, sensitive the interest rate plays out, and so it changes the investment paradigm. The other one that changes the investment paradigm is if you can buy short-term interest rates, it's like you can sit in, you know, people say, you know, what are you doing with your cash? My cash is my best friend today. I mean, because I'm I'm garnering. I talk about commercial paper at six percent, five and a half to six for three months, six month, nine month paper. It changes how you build a portfolio today in a big way.